Because something's screwing up the live stream.
Hello, everybody. Hello, humans. <laughs> uh, glad to see some of you turning out. I think uh, everybody's kind of excited. We have a, a good show lined up for you today. Let me hear from the from those of you who are already online. Where are you tuning in from? Uh, who's out there? Say hi. Let's get some audience interaction going because we're going to want that audience interaction. I want you guys asking questions of our guest today. I will have some nice interactions, some fun. Uh, we'll have a good time. So go ahead and start commenting. Let me know who's out there and, and where you're where you're dialing in from. <laughs> Hope you're not dialing in. <laughs> we've uh, we've moved past the dial in days on the internet. Uh, thank goodness. So uh, if you're just joining for the first time, this is the Tech Humanist Show, and it is a multimedia format program exploring how data and technology shape the human experience. We've got Sam Lau from Southern California. Hi, Sam. Welcome. Um, and go back here. So I'm your host, obviously, Kate O'Neill, and uh, I, oh, <laughs> I'm Georgia from Chicago. That's my mom. My mom is tuned in. That's fun. We've got Mark Bernhard from Wisconsin. Yay, hi Mark. And Davia, Davia, uh, tuning in from Jamaica. Glad to have you. We're, we're truly cosmopolitan now. We're all over the place. So uh, you, hopefully you're following, I see, I see um, Sam and Mark are tuned in from LinkedIn and uh, my mom, Georgia, is tuned in from YouTube. And Davia is tuned in from Facebook. So good, we're getting good good uh, reach across all the different channels. We stream across YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Twitch, although no one watches on Twitch. If you're watching on Twitch, give a special shout out because <laughs> I don't think we've had any viewers from Twitch so far. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest because I know that's why uh, a lot of you are tuned in today. It's really exciting. Today, we are talking with John C. Havens, who is Executive Director of the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. He is also Executive Director of the Council on Extended Intelligence, or CXI. He previously served as an EVP at a top 10 global PR firm, where he counseled clients like Gillette, HP, and Merck on emerging and social media, uh, social media issues. He has authored the book's Heart Official Intelligence, if you caught that, it's Heart Official Intelligence and Hacking Happiness, and has been a contributing writer for Mashable, The Guardian, and The Huffington Post. He's been quoted on issues related to technology, business, and well-being by USA Today, Fast Company, BBC News, Mashable, The Guardian, The Huffington Post, Forbes, Inc., If PR Week in Advertising Age, it just goes on and on. Wait, there's more. This is the best line in the entire bio. You ready? John was also a professional actor in New York City for over 15 years, appearing in principal roles on Broadway, television, and film. So please, audience, start getting your questions ready for our fantastic guest. And please welcome the obviously multi-talented John C. Havens. John, you are live on the Tech Humanist Show. Yeah, Kate O'Neill. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> Thank you Kate. so um, much for being it here. It is an honor to be here. Seriously, I'm stoked to be on your show. Thank you I'm for having me. I'm stoked to have you. You have a fan following. <laughs> Announced the show I, I typically do over the weekend, and all of a sudden there was just this mountain of of a. Uh, in of in stream streaming in notifications that people were super excited and and I got a bunch of outreach from uh, in and everywhere going like oh my gosh I'm so glad you're having John on the show so your your audience is very excited right now <laughs> well well thank you very much and again honor to be here and by the way you were rocking the glasses headset thing I mean it's, it's like you it look like really good I could probably just like glue the top of them on to the top of my headset. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to be seen without the sunglasses on my head. It's one of my... Please don't. I'd be, my, <laughs> I'd be sad. One of my yeah. brand things. I don't know. So naturally, John, I got to start off the question that's the part of your bio that's the least relevant to the topic of the show, but the most colorful. So you were a professional actor. Tell us all about it. Yeah, I moved to New York in 1992 um, when I was like four. <laughs> I'm kidding. Anyway, I moved to New York and 
Yeah, I was in the Screen Actors Guild, uh, Equity, had a great agent for about 15 years. I uh, did small parts, but like in Law & Order, Law & Order, SVU, I did a part in a Broadway show. And uh, yeah, I was an actor for 15 years. That's fantastic. I, I love So it just sort of re- reinforces my longstanding theory that people who have lived multiple lives within their lifetime <laughs> are the most interesting. <laughs> That's very cool. And so what what's the trajectory there, though? Like, when do you go from acting to advising companies on social media to leading ethical guidance for the world's largest association of technical professionals? <laughs> sure. That's a normal trajectory. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of it comes from introspection. Uh, my dad was a psychiatrist. He's passed away. My mom is a minister. So apparently I was just raised in a household where like examining your feelings was kind of a thing. Um, and then acting most of your work being the human condition. And then I was on sets a lot of times my parts were comedic roles. And I did a lot of really bad industrial films like, Bob, I don't think the photocopier works that way. And, that type of stuff. <laughs> and they'd say, can you make this funny? And so I went from writing scripts uh, to then working in PR. And that's where I got the PR job. Back when I got that PR job, my friend was like, come help me run the New York office of this big PR firm. And I was like, I don't know about PR. No one here under Twitter. And I was like, um, and then I found out about IEEE when I was writing a book on AI ethics and I pitched them about this idea. So that's the fast version of the trajectory. Well, how did you get to writing the book on AI ethics? Was that part of the work you were doing with the PR firm or was that on your own somehow? Pure unbridled fear. Fear, my friend. <laughs> Seriously, it was about six years ago. I was writing a series for Mashable. All those articles are still live. And um, what I was finding is that even back six years ago, there were there were only the extremes. Here's the dystopian aspect of AI. Here's the utopian. And I just kept calling people and saying, okay, is there a code of ethics for AI? Because I'd like to know, and that will kind of help balance things out. And more and more, no one knew of one. Mm-hmm. Like, and like, here's the here's the code of ethics for AI from the yada yada, you know, doc, you know. And so I was like, that seems like a good thing to have. Yeah. Well, and, and you have uh, helped create what is one of the most um, useful and informative sets of design ethics, but or, or, or design guidelines, I should say. But we'll, we'll come to that because I want to make sure that we also build into, you know, your uh, your job now, your your multiple roles that build there, there are a lot of words. <laughs> I wonder if you could briefly explain your various roles for us. So many words. I'm going to take the rest of this episode just <laughs> I enjoy. Uh, well, first of all, I should say this. I am deeply honored to work at IEEE. I love my job. On the show, I'm John. So I'm speaking as John. Not all of my statements formally, obviously, um, you know, represent IEEE. So disclaimer alert. Retweets are not endorsements. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, but I just want to say that. Um, So one job, what happened is that this book about uh, a hard artificial intelligence was really saying, what is it about our own values as individuals we may not know? Because if we don't ask, we won't know. And then if we don't know them, we can't live to them. So it's pretty basic, right? People often think, why am I unhappy? And if you don't actually know your values, maybe you're not living to your values. It's not the only reason you'll be unhappy, but it's one of them. So this is a big jump. So enjoy anyone technical on the phone. But when you come to like data scientists, human uh, HCI, human uh, computer interaction, values alignment, it's a technical term, but it's similar, right? What are you building? Who's going to use it? What are their values? How can you align it? So I was writing this book um, really thinking about how is our personal data related to our values? And then how are all these beautiful machines and technologies kind of in one sense looking back at us? And I just had the really good fortune. There were some senior people from IEEE in the audience. It was at South by Southwest. They'd asked me to come speak. And I pitched them. And I got really lucky. There's this uh, guy named Konstantinos Katahalios. He's the managing director of IEEE Standards Association. And he and so many people at IEEE had already been planning something along these lines. Perfect. So I was really catalyst. And then there's hundreds of people who've actually really done the work to create all the work. Perfect. Because, uh, you know, I think a lot of people for a long time have thought of IEEE as, as sort of a, a dry organization concerned primarily with standards and whatnot. I mean, that that's kind of 
the impression that I had when I first came into tech 25 years ago. So it's interesting to change and, and, you know, to know the origin of that change. But how did, how did you come to hold roles that are so clearly focused on human impacts? Was it that the shape was already being created or did you bring that, that, uh, the vision of that to the role? Um, well, first of all, Chirbali, uh, the tagline itself is one of the reasons I actually wanted to work with the organization. It's advancing technology for humanity. I actually, I genuinely love that. Yeah. When I when I first pitched this idea and Constantinos, it resonated with, he built on it. I, I can't say enough good things about him. He's kind of a mentor and he's brilliant. But that word for, F-O-R, right, advancing technologies for humanity, it goes back to values what is the success you're trying to build? You can't just be like, yay, we're advancing technology for humanity. How are you doing that? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So he and so many other people within IEEE, and then IEEE is volunteer driven. So 700 people wrote ethically aligned design. Uh, Constantinos and the team kind of helped shape how it started, but then it was really the experts who wrote the different sections in consensus that created the document, it got pages of feedback, and it had three versions. And a lot of that feedback also came from people. The first version was like Americans, people from the EU created it. But then we got feedback from uh, South Korea, Mexico City, and Japan, which was awesome. Because many of them said, this seems really good, but it feels non-West, or yeah, it feels very Western. You need more non-Western views. And so that always to me, and this is like the favorite part of my job, is like, huh, feedback. That means you want to join a committee. Awesome. <laughs> Well, that's great. I, I think it's really, uh, it's important that you were open to that feedback, that you, you know, you got that kind of feedback. It, it shows a lot of trust that your constituency came back and said, can we incorporate more of a viewpoint that, that, def that deviates from, you know, this kind of Western standard? Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. We, so, I, you know, I think what's so interesting to me is, you know, it, I, I would read through your book, Artificial Intelligence. And you have a couple of uh, quotes in there that, that really stood out. So one is that you said, I am not anti-AI, I am pro-human, which, you know, that resonates with me. Um, but also, I, th I feel like it ties into what you were just talking about it with the slogan of IEEE. But what, to you, what does it mean to be pro-human? Yeah, by the way, I owe you a cup of coffee for reading the whole book. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was um, wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, especially from a media narrative standpoint, there's a lot of us versus them titles that we're often working against in both IEEE and the work in the Council on Extended Intelligence, where you re and I'm doing this for effect, right? You know, <laughs> X new AI, whatever new AI program playing a sport or something destroyed this human in soccer. Or right. Whatever. These extreme hyperbolic terms like eviscerated a human and it's like how do you read that and as a human just as anybody not feel kind of like like crap <laughs> you're, you're like and it, it it makes the technology and the human feel uh, uh, devalued and more importantly the pro-human thing means it's okay to recognize that humans are inherently different than the machines and the tools that we're building and to honor both, you can say, here's where they're different. It doesn't mean you're saying this is bad, this is good. But for instance, and I won't go into this unless you want to, because it gets very philosophy geeky, right? But a I'm lot all of about the philosophy geeky. <laughs> all right, then, two hours later. Bring it. <laughs> I'm on your hunt. Now, um, uh, a lot of Western ethics is built on rationality, right? And rationality is a lot of like democratic ideas come from. Awesome, right? But the yes and to rationality is things like relationality. How do you and I interact as people with our emotion? And then the systems, how do we interact with nature? So if you kind of look at through one lens uh, only of nature of who humans are, it can be easy to say, well, humans are only about what's in our brain. And once John's just information, the cognitive sort of stuff I have in my hard drive is kind of spilled out, that's all I am. But I'm a musician. I'm an actor. I'm a dad. I'm a friend of Kate honored to be here, <laughs> right? And that means those, those uh, ephemera are not minor in terms of how it means we relate to each other and we relate to the world. And then when you go especially to non-Western traditions like the Shinto tradition in Japan 
or many indigenous traditions around the world. We cannot assume anybody, royal we, making technology, that unless we know how others frame these ethical questions about how they look at humans, that the system building are going to be applicable to them. We have to know what they are and work together, um, you know, towards consensus. So say all that. What I, I want to get more at uh, in a in a minute into you know that sort of compilation of ethical views and uh, all the all the philosophical viewpoints that sort of cobble together to inform that. But but I still want to stay with this pro-human idea because I feel like also what you're talking about there, you know, you talked about the human condition earlier and it feels like some of what you're saying is this multi-dimensionality is a really important facet of humanity and of being pro-human. Is that fair? Is that a fair characterization of what you're saying? Yeah, I think it's easy and I sympathize or I should say understand. A lot of times people are like, well, let Usually it's AI, but let this technology take over because humans have screwed everything up, right? It's a, it's the sentiment is understandable, right? People make mistakes; we're all flawed. But I'm not quite sure what someone. Yeah, I tend to get frustrated sometimes with those statements because I'm like, well, a people build the systems. Right. I have for you, so, you know, like, guess what? Secondly, it's the systems underneath the technology that need to be addressed. Right. And then third, I have this sitting by my desk. Um, I'll read this to you. It's this Japanese adage. In Japan, broken objects are often repaired with gold. The flaw is a unique piece of its history, which adds to its beauty. Consider this when you feel broken. Right. Like, what are we supposed to be? Perfect. What does that mean? And what's a perfect man? What's a perfect woman? What's a perfect American? What's a sense? Not who cares. Right. We're asking to understand our values. But the starting point for me as a person and a lot of work that we're doing at IEEE focused on well-being is to say inherently all humans have worth simply because they exist. And so to start to frame the human as being worthwhile because of up here immediately means we're saying we're willing to design technology that is in one sense only for a very small portion of the planet, which is not the case with me, is not the case with IEEE. So if that makes sense, that's the deeper human stuff. It makes great sense to me. I also want to remind the audience, uh, feel free to start uh, funneling in any kind of questions. If, if you're hearing what John is saying and you have questions about what we're talking about, please go ahead and, and ask them. But, you know, here's one that I have is another excerpt from Artificial Intelligence is you wrote, if machines are the natural evolution of humanity, we owe it to ourselves to take a full measure of who we are right now so we can program these machines with the ethics and values we hold dear. And here's a question I get asked all the time, and I'd love to pass it along to you. Whose ethics and whose values are we programming? And how can we be sure we're getting that decision right? Uh, my ethics. <laughs> John's well, way or the highway. <laughs> I'm not, you know, it's not aggressive. It's just it's, it's the way to go. No, great question. I mean, first of all, um, applied ethics, right? There's a lot of discussion around AI, and I'm using air quotes uh, maybe too much. <laughs> but it's a huge <laughs> phrase. What do we mean by AI? Is it machine learning? Is it, you know, inverse reinforcement learning? What do we mean by ethics? Is it just philosophy or is it compliance? But the basic idea is applied ethics is essentially design, right? In form of design. It's saying we want to build a technology. Who are we building it for? What is the definition of value for what we're building? Oftentimes the value framed in exponential growth. Right. Not just profit. I want to be clear. We all need money to pay bills and, and profit is what sustains an organization. Mm -hmm. But exponential growth is an ideology that it's not just about getting some profit or speed. It's about doing this. Well, when you when you maximize any one thing, other things, by definition, empirically take less of a of focus. And especially with humans, that can be things like mental health. Right. I got to kick out this technology to the world because I'm pressured because of market needs. This is not bad or evil. This is why the term ethics can be so confusing, but it is a decision. And in this case, it's a key performance indicator decision where there may be pressure. The priority is to get something, say, to market versus how can we get something to market that best honors end user values in the context of the region where they are, kind of to your last question, mm -hmm. 
And then also, how do we understand what risk and harm is in the algorithmic era? Because one thing I'll say quickly here is a lot of times people are like, AI is just the new tech, you know, and I'm like, sorry, it's just not. Here's why. Data, right, is key. A hundred years ago, like the first car or whatever, didn't have data that would measure us and then go to the cloud. So human data being measured and the ability to immediately go to the cloud is utterly different. And how that data is translated back to us about who we are is deeply affecting human agency, identity, and emotion. Yeah, it's almost like the the earlier example, the car is deciding where to drive us, <laughs> or at least recommending, well, you're saying you want to drive to Chicago, but re- Detroit is nicer this time of year. <laughs> like You should really go to Detroit. Right? Right? <laughs> Well, what do we do about all of the human bias that's already encoded into data sets and algorithms and business logic and all, and all of that? I think the easiest thing is just hate everyone universally, right? Just pure. Sounds rational. Yeah. Uh, no. Not relational, think, but rational. Yes. <laughs> um, I think, first of all, for me, is there's different levels I'm learning about bias. And again, I want to be clear. I'm speaking here as John, not as I triple the whole organization. Um, and if I have the book here, I'll show it. Yeah, I have the book here. So one thing that, you know, everyone uh, assumedly in the industry, the AI industry is focused on is things like eradicating bias. And here, personal heroes of mine, uh, Joy Bulamwini uh, has done some phenomenal work with aspects to, um, you know, uh, any device that won't measure brown or dark skin or, or black skin tones in the same way as, as white tones. She's also done some amazing work with the actual terminology and I'm blanking on the term, but like the taxonomy uh, of how different um, data sets are created around the framing of those skin colors. Anyway, Joy Bulamwini, awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing I think I'm just learning, and I'll hold up the book, it's called uh, Race After Technology by Dr. Ruha Benjamin from Princeton. And forgive me if you, I know you've interviewed people I think have talked about this type of stuff. Um, and I heard about her from the Radical AI podcast. Shout out to my friends Dylan and Jess. They have a great show. Um, Ruha uh, Benjamin was on the show. She gave the example about bias, and I'm going to paraphrase this wrong, so please read her book. But the logic of for people creating tools, looking for data, anyone creating AI, they might go to say like, I live in New Jersey, right? So there's an area of New Jersey where there's 100,000 citizens who have been measured by one metric, which is the census data, right? So 100,000 people live here. Then there's data about something health or medical oriented. Of these 100,000 people, X amount did whatever in terms of, I don't know, cardiology. Now, that that insight or that data about that data set is now what's being used hypothetically or in in reality, but I'm giving an example, Mm -hmm. by everyone creating AI. And then they're saying, we're saying, let's make sure that that uh, AI is accountable and transparent and fair and all those things, which is we should. But she made the key point to me, which blew my mind, and I'm I'm frankly a little embarrassed. I hadn't thought of it before, is the assumption is that of those 100,000, all 100,000 citizens have access to the health and medical data. When in fact, whether it's marginalized populations, whether it's people that just didn't have, you know, they weren't able, whatever, the number may be significantly lower. So underlying and analyzing the systems, by the way, is a design thing. I know the term marginalized obviously can be very heated and whatever else. For me, uh, let's move some of those terms out. They're critically important. But the point is, is as people who want to design this technology holistically well for everyone, especially Dr. Benjamin's ideas really helped me think about, we have to be thinking about building for all, not just those who we are building for, not realizing who we're missing in the process. Well, and you're speaking about layers of design, right? It's it's the important thing about a term like marginalization and what it implies is that there are systems, and we can recognize that there are. Systems. But you're, I think, a lot of times the the design of technology or of technological experiences is focused on the technology and not on the sociological and cultural implications that are wrapped in and around that technology. And I think uh, so much of what's important about the work that you've been doing and the work of some of the people that you've mentioned is to unpack a lot of those those assumptions and say, it's not just going to exist in a void or a vacuum, <laughs> it's going to be used in culture. And these things create experiences that scale our culture 
and we need to be able <clears throat> to understand, you know, what the implications of, of those design decisions are. Yeah, exactly. So I, I want to ask you too about automation because we have actually had a pretty good amount of discussion with some of the guests who have been on uh, the show, past episodes of the show so far about AI ethics and less about automation per se. And obviously I, I realize that a lot of what needs unpacking about automation does have to do with intelligence, um, but there are still questions about what we automate and how <clears throat> and who is affected. So do you anticipate there ever being a discourse on the ethics of automation that, that gets much attention that's separate or related to the ethics of AI? Well, I'm really glad you asked that. We, for ethically aligned design, uh, we actually used the term uh, autonomous and intelligent systems. Because to your point, you know, if we want to define artificial intelligence, we'd be here for seven hours, you know. When you get in a room of anybody defining it, it's, it's very challenging. So at least to your point, or I'm saying I agree with you, we said, let's talk about automation versus, air quote, intelligence without being anthropomorphic. But the term intelligent systems is a, a, a you know, classifier of, say, like um, uh, certain types of uh, uh, learning and what have you. Mm -hmm. Automation, you know, everyone uses this example, and I always forget what it's called. But in a car for the like the last 30 years, uh, cruise control, right? You're driving at 60 miles an hour and you push a button. That's already option. And then we're used to with simple tools, I don't know, uh, spell check, or, uh, things like that's not probably a good example. A lot of my book was focused on what are the things either that we don't ever want to automate or we want to make sure that we have the option to be in the midst of that process and not always automate. So a good example I give there is say like a dating app, right? The tools, and this is like eHarmony and some of the other services use really complex and frankly very impressive mm -hmm. uh, machine learning uh, alg algorithms to help you choose who you'd want to be with and by the way some of the some of these things there's not a moral or ethical issue it's like do you live in Denver Colorado yes do you want to date someone in Nome Alaska no thank you <laughs> you know so it's not like this complex thing but the thing is at some point there may be aspects of a decision someone else has made where you now aren't in the mix and maybe you won't meet a person who you would have met under different circumstances. By the way, that happens in real life as well. Mm -hmm. Point is, is if we have upfront disclosure about those tools, access to data, and most importantly, we have a choice uh, and we know that we have that choice and we make the choice. This is where, for instance, in my life, I don't want anything to quote automate my decision around parenting, right? Or whatever it is. It's not that it's wrong or right. It's just that that reflects my values. Is hey, look at this parenting app. I don't have to do anything. Hey, son, talking to you here. Apparently, you're mad. You know, yada yada yada. What do I do? <laughs> okay, I'm supposed to spank you, right? That is totally fictional. But my point is, is like how easy it could be to avoid any choice. This is not about the technology. The technology is astoundingly beautiful and amazing, but us not being in the mix means that we don't learn ourselves or train ourselves or focus on our own values. Well, there was just that article in, I don't remember if it was the New York Times or what, but that was about parents sort of offloading the the, dic the dictation of terms of various kinds to their, children, to, to their Alexas and smart speakers. So if they need to tell a kid what to do, it's like have the smart speaker tell the kid what to do or something like that. So the, the job of discipline is already, I think, being automated in some sense. But I think to some of what you're saying, there's there's the distinction between automating away versus automating around. Like, you know, when you talk about automating parenting, I think, you know, it's implied that you're saying you don't want to automate away parenting. But you could certainly make some seamlessness or some conveniences around parenting through automation and it wouldn't be uh it, it wouldn't necessarily be a moral uh controversy right no not at all and i'm glad you brought it up and i will say though the metrics are, are key here right like as a parent i have two kids they were young i would have given a good amount of money to sleep through the night when they were getting sleep trained for instance right and and a lot of these a lot of these tools can read bedtime stories etc but I wrote an article about this. Um, I have to. I'll send you the link for the show notes. Um, where, where the question that I'm about is take something to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. And again, I want to be clear: this is not about the technology, right? This is about societal choices. 
But what happens if you use like six different parenting apps or tools and eventually your kid says, you know, I'm good. You know, dad, I know you wanted to go on a walk with me or you wanted to talk about whatever, but I'm going to go through my six or seven different things. And thanks so much. I, I don't really I don't want you to read me a story. I don't want you to take me on a walk. I hang a robot. I don't need your advice about girls. Very 21st use- century cat's cradle story. Yeah, and, <laughs> and I'm not trying to judge any family or, or a kid, right? Like balance of I'm not telling a kid what they should or shouldn't do. But I think if we sort of usurp, I'm sorry, if we eschew and give away that. And, and what I'm saying give away is more like the ultimate sense of, of why looking at our values and this in case for parenting are so critical. The answer is outside of the technology, right, or policy, you may wake up one day and be like, what did I just give away? I don't know. But the metrics are critical here, right? Because mostly a lot of times, um, and this is outside of like GDP and exponential growth, um, we tend to focus on what can I do to get from five now to be happy? And a lot of times that's productivity. I can be more productive. So we ignore the now. And a lot of my work has been in positive psychology. My last two books focused a lot. Most of gratitude is just being able to look at what you have now and say, this is stuff I really treasure and value. And then that's where you'd be able to make that decision if parenting, for instance, is one of those things. Well, then I'm going to allocate time with my kids, even though that half an hour dinner or hour at dinner, I could be doing more work. So it's actually very pragmatic and practical. And that's most of what my last two books are focused on is please think about this so you can make these choices so you're not 10 years later like, you know, to your point, cat's cradle, weeping in your beer. Like, why don't my kids talk to me anymore? You know, <laughs> They talk to the smart speakers still. Yeah. <laughs> it's also, it reminds me uh, in, in my own work, one of the things that I talk about is with, with the concept of meaning uh, being a very human centric concept and that meaningful experiences, the, the meaningfulness is one of the, the, the great sort of characteristics of experiences that we should be trying to design through technology and beyond. But that one of the things that happens with automation, it feels like, is that we focus a lot on, as you say, productivity, and we try to automate the things that are mundane or repetitive or that that feel like they take away our, our cognitive focus. And yet, I feel like if you take that to scale, and you only have automated the things that are mundane and meaningless, then you end up in a horrible dystopia when that is what surrounds us. And so there, there's this kind of counterpoint where I feel like we need to be infusing more meaning. And I think it comes back to your idea of infusing the values into, into the discussion and making sure that what's automated reflects meaning and reflects values, but it isn't automating the meaningful things that you're doing. Is that, would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. And I, I think also I've read a lot of media where there's a lot of assumptions that I would even call, if not arrogant, certainly dismissive, if not wildly rude. So, you know, there's you'll read an article that's like, well, this machine does X, it shovels because no one wants to shovel for a living. Right. I'm, I'm just bringing this right. up. And no, that's good. It's a good point. I'm not focusing on the tech. Right. If like there's a John Deere automated shoveler, I'm sure it's fantastic, is to say we've all done jobs of any kind. Uh, uh, that elements of it you really don't like and you wish could be automated. But usually that's because you do the job long enough to realize this part of my job I wish would be automated, right? Things like shoveling. I don't know. Yeah, I, a lot of people would not be like, give me 40 years of shoveling. I've done a lot of, uh, like, especially when I was a younger person, I did a lot of, like, you know, camp counselor jobs for the summer where I was outside, you know, I was doing physical labor. It was awesome. That said, I knew, okay, this was great for what it was. I kind of don't want to do this for my whole life. But the other thing there, which I really get upset about when I read some of those articles, is what if whatever the job is, insert job X, which could be automated, is how someone makes their living, Mm -hmm. right? Then it's not just a value judgment about the nature of the actual labor itself, but is sort of saying like, really what someone says there is from the economic side of it, it's justified to automate anything that can be automated because someone can make money from it outside of what that person needs to do to make money for them and their family. And again, a company having a cool idea to build something that's automation oriented, that's awesome. But we have to have a discussion about 
what jobs you know might go away where again the metrics are if it's exponential growth ultimately then i don't see why anything that humans do would not be automated period like i have not been to a policy meeting or whatever yet where someone's like hold on we need to not build x because some humans won't whatever the work discussion comes up a lot right but there's no like policy saying okay uh veterinarians <laughs> Nothing's going to be automated with veterinarians ever again because animals are by humans or whatever, you know. But why is that not brought up? It's because there's the assumption at all times that the main uh, indicator of success is exponential growth. And a lot of my work is to say, I don't think that's true, especially when mental health and the environment come into play. What about those two pretty big areas of our lives? Yeah, I, that's a really good distinction. And I think it's also, it, it leads me into another question that I had, which is around that we talk a lot when it comes to automation about, I think the first impact people tend to think of is the automation as it relates to human jobs and human work in the not distant future and, and how that's going to displace and replace in some cases categories of jobs. And it certainly feels like that's an important topic, but it feels like it's also important to step back and, and look even more broadly at the way automation affects categories of human experiences as a whole, right? Across employment and healthcare and communication and government and, and so on. So when you think about that, where do you spend the most mental cycles or mental energy when it comes to automation and the future of humanity and making sure we get that focus right in terms of the policy and in terms of the way we, we go about implementing around it? No, great question. Um, there's three things in an ethically aligned design. Now, here's where I'm, I'm being either pitchy or I'm not objective. And a lot of this is because the 700 volunteers that wrote ethically aligned design, they're friends and I, I massively respect the work they did. So we have the first chapter of a 300 page document is our general principles. And the logic is those other chapters inform those general principles, like which one should we have? And then from a consensus kind of voting standpoint, um, the logic was we ordered those three first general principles in the order of importance. So the first principle is human rights. And that's something that a lot of the lawyers and you know, the work that we had were like, hey, <laughs> And the first couple of times he said it, frankly, it kind of hit me, maybe because it's like, this is easy. We finally were able to draft something. But we had this big event in Austin, and a lot of the lawyers were like, look, ethics is great. Applied ethics, we get it. That's design. We cannot ignore international human rights as it's been established from the UN and, and whoever else. I thought that made sense. <laughs> and globally, human rights is very challenging. How do you implement it, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also, it is international, right? The logic is... Any country violates human rights, any country supports human rights in different instances. But the point is, if when you're building any technology, but especially with AI, a first lens is what can we look at? Like the Ruji principles or Ruji, I always get this wrong, Ruji, Ruggie principles. Anyway, those principles, the UN principles as they were uh, adapted to business, that lens of let's not design something that knowingly would violate human rights. And that to me is... That's a line in the sand. And again, that comes from ethically aligned design, not just John. Uh, the second area is data agency or data sovereignty. And that means beyond privacy, right? GDPR in the states, the California Privacy Acts, E-Estonia, all this amazing work saying, how do we protect people's data? But, uh, you know, in one sense, it's like, what else are we going to do, <laughs> right? Like governments protecting people's data, that's kind of the job, right? And I'm not saying this in a teasing sense. I'm saying like, thank God for the GDPR. However, that does not empower the person to be able to say with my identity source, kind of a personal data locker, right? Which John has his data. Then when I want to exchange data with my friend, you, I can do it in a peer-to-peer -peer way, blockchain or whatever. I have access to my data. I have portability of my data. This is data sovereignty where the end user means they actually have a voice. And especially now that we're getting into augmented and virtual and extended reality, right, and the spatial web, we have to understand in every AI conversation to move, not just talk about privacy, but we must talk about data sovereignty and giving people agency over their data. And the last thing I'll say I've already touched on is what we talk about, uh, well-being indicators. That term can be confusing because people well-being and they think wellness. 
and it sounds like a yoga mat <laughs> right, or, something. or it may be like well-being that's like fitness. It's not. It's uh, started with Bhutan's Gross National Happiness. Now there's the UN SDGs. The OECD has their Better Life Index. It simply means that when we build anything, multiple lenses of societal success must be taken into account or we will build for the one thing that we say is the most important. It's not really rocket science. And it's not about good or evil or whatever else. It's about recognizing that years ago, the gross domestic product was born in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, with very specific values at the time. Newsflash was written by men, and that's why caregiving, for instance, is not recognized in the GDP. Guess what right now the world is facing the most with COVID, Mm -hmm. the lack of caregiving, right? How ludicrous would it be to design a tracing app or anything for COVID and be like, caregiving, I don't need to know the number, right? But it wasn't put in the GDP. So that doesn't mean throw out the GDP with the bathwater, but it certainly means other measures must be used when we create these amazing technologies. And here I'll end with an amazing precedent, which is New Zealand. I bow down to New mm-hmm. Zealand. We and all do. <laughs> the, uh, Prime Minister, I have a very appropriate and ethical crush on you. Um, they do so much work. They had a well-being 2019 budget where they just have five areas. Fiscal is one of them, right? Kind of the GDP. Those metrics can still be used. But they talk about children's mental health and they talk about the environment. And then their AI plan, it's a whole separate AI plan, the success metrics for the AI, the technology they build, ladders up to that. All five of those have to be served, not just one. And by the way, not even just children's mental health, right? It's a balance. That also means the money really is about how do we serve our people and our planet with the money versus exponential growth is number one. And we'll give you some spare change for the other stuff. So New Zealand is a wonderful precedent along these lines. Yeah, I wonder, it really struck me when I was looking at, um, by the way, while we were talking about this, I'm going to throw the URL ethicsinaction.ieee.org up on the screen. Uh, and of course, this will go to audio for pod. I'll just read that aloud one more time, ethicsinaction.ieee.org. Thank and you. It, yeah, as we're talking about this um, ethically aligned design, landmark resource uh, on a uh, autonomous how do you characterize it is autonomous intelligence systems is that right yeah now we say artificial intelligence systems and it's also the oecd preferred term it just means kind of everything in one so you don't have to say like this type of learning that type of learning this type of learning it just means all of it artificial intelligence systems but at the time we said autonomous and intelligent systems. So we've just evolved what we say. Okay. So I did find what was one thing really interesting about that was that aspect that found, as you, you just talked about, the well-being. And that, that really struck me um, as something very encouraging uh, and fascinating because it feels very open-ended. And uh, it makes sense to me because I'm someone who loves to live in nuance and I think a lot about you know human experience and, and the outcomes of, of technology but I wondered if that has prompted uh, feedback from the practitioner, practitioner community because it is so open-ended and, and seemingly subjective as a recommendation. Sure. No, it's, I think a lot of it is also um, – I just became facet. Like if someone's like, hey, you're going to talk about GDP all the time, like 10 years ago, I'd be like, wow, that sounds like a boring life. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I mean it's, it's no law and order SVU, but <laughs> – Well, hello. If you need a fake police officer, I'm your guy. Um, <laughs> But really, it's like if I just said to you, you know, Kate, tell me about your day today. What made it worthwhile? And Mm -hmm. we were having a cup of coffee at the end of the day. You might be like, I had a great show. (laughs) Thank you. And then like I had time with friends and whatever else. If you never reflected on that, right, you just have a pastiche of a kind of general sense of whatever. And then certainly if you were going to build, say, policy, future aspects of your life built on data, you'd be like, you know what? I only know my bank account number. And I know how much I pay for rent, right? And I'm giving a stark example of those are the things that we've been trained to think are the only things that are worthwhile measuring. Mm-hmm. It's ludicrous. Yeah, of course know about your money. That's incredibly important. And I understand too, like I was in the quantified self movement a lot two years ago with my other book, Hacking Happiness. And look, this is not about for six months, like walking around and being like, I'm wearing 94 sensors and Kate just used a vowel and I write that down. Right? <laughs> it's about measuring things that are important to you for a while and realizing these are my values right now, even writing them down and then knowing that you're living to them. Right. So 
I bring that up because the well-being thing, first of all, there's a lot of ignorance. For me, there was about what the GDP, for instance, even is. There's a lot of great TED videos, TED, uh, TED Talk videos, and I'm trying to remember the guy that'll come to me. Uh, all right, I'll, t- I'll tell the story and then I'll remember who he is. But it's one of the highest rated TED videos, and he talks about the GDP. There's this sense that subjective data is kind of not worthless, but is like Kate and John both give our views, right? On Netflix, eventually that might mean something because we've given five-star ratings. He pointed out in his talk, Chris, it'll come to me, darn it. Anyway, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> um, uh, that the majority of the GDP data is based on subjective data. And why that is, is that service industries base most of their success criteria on surveys, right? And service industries make up like 65% of the GDP. So really what that means is I go to a hotel, what does everyone still ask, right? It's the modern algorithmic age. What have you never not gotten in an email, (laughs) a survey? How was your stay at our hotel? And you give that rating. Now in aggregate, this is where it sort of magically transforms into objective data that now apparently is worthwhile. So all that is to say the well-being indicators, there's a lot of confusion about what they are, understandably. But then when you also think about a country like Bhutan that has measured their environment very specifically with really interesting, fascinating, in-depth metrics, that's why, for instance, they were able to eradicate smog above their tree line because they made it a priority to, to, uh, to get rid of it and also reflects their values. So there's so much of what we measure that reflects a real core ideology that none of us really even knows how it started or why. But it reflects deep systems from 70, 80, 90 years ago that frankly just totally need to change. Because the status quo, it's not just about dealing with questions of critical questions of systemic bias, uh, racial bias, or what have you. It's about how are we designing these tools and why would we only want to have them do this one thing versus question. And that's what, like, uh, we have a standard that came out called 7010, 7010, focused on well being, which is mainly about showing look at all these indicators and start asking, what would it look like if I built my AI tool? with all of these, like three or four of these lenses, not just this one. And it becomes innovation, right? Because the last thing I'll say in this answer is, I rarely hear innovation framed around anything except money, right? Don't hinder innovation really means don't mess with money, which my answer is, why can't that question be, how can we make innovation about mental, how can we make it about the the environment? That's beautiful, and it's so it's so aligned with my own work. So I talk about uh, the the lenses on meaning and the different the the framework of meaning as all these different kinds of the things that we understand as humans, like all the way from the lowest level, like semantics and communication, through things like relevance and significance and truth and purpose that are kind of mid-grade, but but they frame a lot of what we, we do and what we think, all the way out to these big macro questions of existential and cosmic meaning, like what's it all about and why are we here? But they all boil down to what matters. And then for me, the question of innovation is always a question of what is going to matter. So if you use those two lenses, you know, what matters and what's going to matter, it feels like that's a, a very aligned uh, way of, of looking at what you're talking about as mm-hmm. well, that, you know, that, that en- emphasis on uh, not measuring everything. You don't have to be sort of the quantified self person that's got, as you say, 90 sensors on yourself, because not all of that matters. And, and you don't have to know, you know, how many vowels you're tracking at any given point in time, uh, that's not, it's never going to be a meaningful thing. It's not, unless there is some, some specific meaningful application at some point in your life. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a big takeaway. I I love that. And I'm glad that you've put that out there, that you and your team have put that out there in such unambiguous terms for the community to be able to think about well-being in this very dimensional way and, and make sure that that's represented in, in the way that they're building. Yeah, and one, one point I'll make here is that, we, well, I don't we need to take the credit, but in the sense of like um, Joseph Stiglitz, who everyone I think knows, world-famous economist, uh, it was 2009 at the time President Sarkozy of France got uh, Stiglitz, Amatya Sen, all these globally renowned economists together and said, look, Is GDP the ultimate measure of societal success? Yes or no? Stop messing around. And you can look at the 2009 document 
where all these different leaders said it is easier to measure well-being than it is to measure the statistical aspects of GDP. And it may sound boring, and uh, maybe I'm a GDP geek, but when you look at statistics, right, for GDP, it's a backward measure. How did we do last quarter? How did we do last year? Right. So you, first of all, by definition, and I'm not trying to put GDP down, I'm just putting it down to the side and saying you're not living in the moment. Right. You're not asking about value right now. Mm -hmm. Why is John happy right now? Because he's talking with his friend Kate, who's awesome. And is, is I really feel purpose talking about this work for my triple E that I love so much. Right. As compared to I just live my life and next, you know, the end of the month. Hey, what did you do? And when you also think about what is a person's life? Like as a parent, I'm a parent, you know, would you say to your kid like, hey, you're making friends, you know, you're doing this. I've taught you the nature of like whatever. Oh, you found a, a love, you know, a partner. Cool. Did you get an A in class and how much money do you make at your job? Right. But right. guess what? Guess what? Most of their lives. Yeah, I'm looking for love and this is all important, but I can't say that's important because that's that's frivolous. Did you make money? Do you have a good job? That's it. That's because underlying so much of modern society, 70 years ago, this one thing became the thing. That's why I love IEEE, by the way, too, because advancing technology for humanity, like I mentioned, by definition, you can't just say, how do we build stuff for whatever? It's all these beautiful, and by the way, the global aspect of my job, I love. I'm on the phone. Granted, my sleep schedule gets messed with. But I'm on the phone all the time, like with India or the Philippines. And, and that's a real blessing for me because automatically you, you, you just hear right away different people's values. Right. Money is always important, but it's not the only thing. Yeah, my day started out with a call with India as well. And, and uh, we just joked before we got on the broadcast, you and I were joking. I'll share with our audience. We're like, we haven't seen each other since Lisbon. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. we should definitely say that on the air because that sounds so bad. Like, oh, gosh, how have you been since Lisbon? Well, we know how you've been since Lisbon, actually. <laughs> yeah. It's called COVID, so yeah. Right. <laughs> but no, it is. It's wonderful. I love the fact that, you know, my work is also global, and I appreciate that you appreciate that about your work as well. It's it's, it's great that that holistic global perspective on, on the work. You I was wondering, you know, I have I have generally these kind of recurring show questions that I like to, to bring in a few, and, and one of them that I like to ask is, uh, you know, what are you most optimistic about when it comes to technology? Like, what when you look at the future of human experiences and how technology can impact it, what, what gives you the most hope? Uh, I know I'm going to sound like a fanboy, but it's, it's actually true. One thing I love about IEEE is anyone's welcome to something. <laughs> And I think about this all the time. I'm so blessed in this job, but I am not an engineer. I am not an ethicist. I'm not a data scientist. Like the list of what I am technically not, like if you want a PhD, is pretty extensive. Um, but I'm, I'm not just proud. I'm, I'm genuinely honored and thrilled that because of my skill sets, which involve like business development, community development, I got to come with this idea that was a very early germ of an idea to this amazing organization and say, I, my, my perception is it does need to be you. You seem like the only organization that could build a global code of ethics because it will work because <laughs> you're engineers. So it will actually function. Um, but the other thing about that cross pollination and interdisciplinary aspect of our work, one thing with ethically aligned design is one of my favorite things is saying to the amazing engineers and data scientists, hold on, let me get my friends who are mental health specialists and sociologists and anthropologists and, you know, women and, by the way, kids. And it's like then the consensus building aspect. Consensus is, by the way, very hard. It's very hard. And it's not about getting uniform agreement across everything. But I triply, especially the Standards Association, what I love is coming to consensus means we're going to get in a room we're going to be passionately arguing for a while, but we all have this vision of advancing technology for humanity or the stuff in ethically aligned design, and we're going to do it together. It's wonderful. And when you think about what we could do in culture, uh, I, I, whether it's governments, companies, or individuals, to <clears> stand a better chance of bringing about the best futures with tech rather than the worst futures, obviously, you know, you could point to, and I'll throw that URL back up on the screen here, uh, 
ethicsinaction.ieee.org. But in addition to that, like, or, or maybe one thought that kind of stands apart from that, what do you think it is that we could most emphasize to focus on in culture to, to bring that best, to bring about those best futures in, with tech? Um, I'll go back to the metrics, which is my dream on a personal level, but it's reflected in ethically aligned design, is that nothing ever, 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 ever is built again. And by this, I mean designed at the very outset. You know, someone, Susan goes, I have an idea for a new tech. And she says that, and then she goes to someone else. And immediately, not just 7010, but the mindset of how are we going to build this knowing that the actual ultimate key performance indicator is the increase, the knowable, provable increase of long-term human well-being, holistic well-being, mental, physical, education, access to stuff. And that's on top of Maslow. They have to have access to water and food and all that. So human well-being in uh, symbiosis, meaning complete connection with environmental flourishing, mm. where we cannot think about AI as like, I'm just a brain. Kate's just a brain. Copy those brains and we're good to go. Right. It ignores so many indigenous traditions, so many, tra and just the reality of the interplay of systems thinking from people like Donella Meadows and, and other, you know, titans and heroes of mine. So if every bit of, every bit of technology was developed where you knew the key performance indicator that would be blessed from shareholders, stakeholders, CEO, all the value chain was, wait a second, is that tech, how can we point to it increasing human well-being in the environment? Then that means we wouldn't be facing mental health crises um, you know, the environment it is today with these amazing tools that we're building, right? All the great algorithms, AI, all the wonderful things happening. Think of the, the majesty of what it would mean if around the world we knew that we could point to indicators saying, well, this thing is going to be built and I know. And, and again, look to New Zealand. They're doing this. It's so exciting, right? And by the way, they invite their indigenous uh, First Nations citizens into the work. So that's the other part of it is seeing those who aren't seen, right? The marginalized women, a lot of times, in, in, in many instances, we cannot build these amazing technologies and say it's quote, you know, for all of humanity, when we're not actually listening to all of humanity and especially asking really tough questions, who's been marginalized and why? And it's not about making other people feel bad. It's about saying design won't be holistic unless we have everyone uh, participating in the process. Yeah, and I think another thing about what you were saying in terms of like, it's not just John as a brain and Kate as a brain, and let's just replicate that, is that it not only does it ignore uh, so many of the uh, the nuances of, of human existence, but it ignores that human experience is an embodied experience and that we are sensory beings and that senses are how we make meaning. And so we couldn't possibly have meaning experiences if they didn't have an understanding of our embodied sort of acceptance of those experiences, which is why it takes having a diverse and inclusive group to be able to understand how those experiences affect us when we, when we experience them in an embodied way. So that I feel like that's a, a really important facet too of, of what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, Oh, sorry, I know we're at time. I'll just say the environment, the more I, I read indigenous and First Nations uh, work, uh, and I hear, especially a friend of mine in New Zealand, I forget which, tra oh, Maori tradition. Mm -hmm. she when you speak to someone where the environment is actually more of like a sister or a brother, as in the West, I was raised to think about my actual nuclear family, it becomes a very different conversation about, quote, protecting the environment. Like, I wouldn't say to Kate, like, Kate, are you cool with me threatening the life of your mom? Who's on the phone still. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Um, that's a given, right? So this is also being sensitive to the end user values of the people who are using the technology. Um, it's been really helpful because then it's like the system of, of what we're part of, of course, involves the environment. Of course, is it's part of who we are. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a really important clarification too. What is, what is the, uh, the IEEE's roadmap from here and what is your roadmap from, from this point forward? Well, IEEE is a big organization because there's multiple parts to it. The Advancing Technology for Humanity, there's a huge amount of work on the environment, which is astounding and awesome. There's like 40 societies, ton of great work going on at IEEE. Work that I help drive, um, we're really focusing on aspects of trust and agency. Mm. AI, I find agency fascinating because trust is, a lot of times it's like, how do we trust technology? Where for me, the, the question about agency means 
if I make technology that's safe, I have to give it to Kate and, and give Kate the opportunity to really interact with it. And then you'll tell me if you trust, not just am I a safe manufacturer, but what it does in your life. And that agency then means that's when trust really happens. It's two-sided. Um, also, I love these non-Western questions. I've been learning a ton um, from other cultures about what safety and risk and all those things mean. Um, but anyway, any thank you so much for saying the Ethics in Action URL. All of the stuff that I drive is free to join. You don't have to be an IEEE member. We're always looking to get people under working groups. We have about 13 standards working groups focused on things like transparency, children's data, um, effective computing. And we're always looking to grow those groups and get new brains and, and voices involved. So we'd love to have people join. Should people go to just IEEE.org to find that? Or is there a particular area? Oh, uh, actually, ethicsandaction.ieee.org is the stuff that I help lead. And, and by the way, I'm on Twitter. Anyone who wants to contact me directly, I'm happy to 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 reach out on Twitter too. Yeah, that's the last question here is how can people find and follow you and your work online? And so we know John C. Havens on Twitter, right? Uh, any <laughs> other pertinent URLs or handles that people should know? Well, thanks again. I'm going to mention it again. Ethicsinaction.ieee.org is like the big one. Um, and then really, if you want to get in touch to get involved with something, Twitter is usually what I check uh, freakishly often. Enjoy. <laughs> freakishly often how i would describe my twitter lifestyle too <laughs> well, come on. supposed to be honest yeah absolutely well john i can't tell you what a pleasure it's been and and i what a fan i am of your work you, you had a lot of fans who were excited about you being on the show and i can see why of course because you're brilliant and i love where your heart is in this work so thank you for doing what you're doing well, thank you. Seriously, it was so great. I'm going to say this. It was awesome to see you in Lisbon because I was reminded like, oh, my gosh, it is amazing. And I love you know, what you're doing with the show. And it's a real honor to be here. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thanks to all of our listeners and viewers out there. See you next time.